You're watching Ujama. Have you ever wanted to just pick up that delicious hamburger? Well, you might want to think again. I'm your host, Michael Dorsonville, and did you know that more than one third of the children in the United States are overweight or obese? This is due to a wide variety of factors. However, obesity is more prominent in low income communities and disproportionately affects people of color. In the low income inner city neighborhoods across the USA, Fast food chains line the blocks of the busiest streets, crowded with customers in a hurry, so many kids don't understand where their food comes from and are at the highest risk of diet-related health problems such as obesity. However, there are people that are fighting this epidemic. They educate youth to not only eat healthy, but also sustain healthy food options for the entire community. Today, we're going to meet one of them. Today's guest has been immensely dedicated to food justice for most of her life. She started out as an immigrant from Jamaica that faced the intimidating journey of assimilating to the United States, but soon became an advocate for major food justice issues, organized the Youth Food Justice Network, and became the market and outreach coordinator for East New York Farms, an urban farm and major community center in East New York, Brooklyn. Her, along with her other organizations, educate youth about food, cultivation, and sustainability. We would like to welcome to the show, Aishima Harris. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. So who is Aishima Harris? Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's the hardest thing to talk about yourself. Um, so I'm a Jamaican born um, and raised and I came from Jamaica to America um, mm -hmm. when I was 12 years old. Okay. And yeah, I started to slowly transition myself into the American culture, trying to speak proper. Because mm -hmm. um, when I first came here, my accent was like a major challenge. Yeah. And a lot of people used to make fun of it or like try to intimidate my accent because they thought it was cool. But yeah. for me, it wasn't cool because I felt like everything I was saying was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and who am I? I um, said I was born and raised in Jamaica. Then I came here, got into education while um, I attend York College. Okay. I'm a junior. I'm studying political science and sociology. Okay. Um, and I'm also an organizer in food justice. Okay. Um, how was your experience growing up in Jamaica? Is there anything you miss in specifically? Yeah, <laughs> I miss like going outside and like cooking my own food. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I miss. I miss like raising chickens that I know mm. I could like go and. A little Henry? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we don't name them, but that would be different. Mm -hmm. um, but I just like miss my whole culture where everything is just natural and in the open. Mm -hmm. um, and learn how to do things from a young age. Like a lot of times whenever I look at the American culture and compare that with the Jamaican culture, mm -hmm. um, for me, especially like when I look at my family dynamic, or I'm with my cousin, like they wouldn't know how to properly like cut up a chicken or whatever. Yeah. And then for me, I'd be like, I'll do it. And <laughs> then I, when I do it, they'd be like, how do you know how to do that? And I'm like, I been you how to do this since I was like eight. Like mm -hmm. it's my culture. That's something I'm used to. So like the natural organic um, value of my culture, that's what I miss the most. And the weather, obviously. Um, did being an immigrant from Jamaica bring you any challenges? Because you were talking about being picked on and... What were they, and how did you overcome them? Um, one, <laughs> it was the weather, because I came here for Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I first migrated here. Uh -huh. And as soon as I walked out of the airport, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. why? I want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw snow for the first time. Yeah. So to me, that was very exciting. Um, 
So that was a challenge is like adapting to the weather and then being homesick. So I tend to miss my mom a lot. Like every day I would call her and like cry. Like, oh, I miss you. I want to come back home. (laughs) Um, And another challenge, like I said, is like with my accents, I had to like read out loud in order for me to like become more American, you could say, or like get the American accent. Um, So I had to do a lot of like enunciation with my words. I had to like read out loud. Like whenever I'm reading a book, it could be just me in the room. I make sure that I'm reading out loud so I could get the words correctly. So that was a challenge. And um, a challenge like trying to assimilate was in school as well because I grew up in like a culture where I have to wear uniforms. It doesn't matter like which school you go to or where where you're going to coming to America where you have to buy clothes and mm-hmm. you have to buy clothes to keep up with the fashion and to fit in. Yeah. So that was also a challenge for me because I'm like, depending on my parents, like, hey, I want to go shopping. And they're like, um, mm-hmm. relax. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, in Jamaica, you don't have to worry about that. You just like wear the same uniform every yeah. single day. So that's not like something you have to keep on like bothering your parents about. Whereas in American culture, you have to like consistently having to like keep up with like the fashion trend. and style mm-hmm. and everything. So that was very difficult for me. At first, yeah. Okay. Um, so, w- what are the some of the things you're passionate about then? Um, passionate about food, mm-hmm. youth. Like just anything. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. <laughs> food is one of them. Um, yeah. And youth in itself, like youth work, youth advocacy. I'm very passionate about that. Like, I make sure that all the work that I'm doing, all, all the work that I'm involved with, mm-hmm at least have some form of youth connection with that. Yeah. Um, and if it doesn't, I try to go into like adult dominated spaces and like involve like youth voices in that and introduce youth in that. Yeah, okay. So that's something I'm very passionate about and that's like something I make sure that I'm doing throughout my life. Tell us about the education because you mentioned you were a major in political science, mm-hmm. right? W- what made you choose that? Honestly, at first, <laughs> my I went in as a, um, a bio major, and I was mm-hmm. like, ah, it's too difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, I was a bit like, what am I doing to myself? Why am I stressing myself out, you know? Yeah. So then my best friend, she was in political science, and she was telling me, this is so amazing. This is so great. I want to be more involved with it. Um, she was telling me all these cool things that she's she was learning. I was like... I want to try it. Mm-hmm. I want to give it a go. So I did political science and I enjoyed it. I learned a lot of like, most of the things that I've learned in political science for me impacted the way how I view food justice. Mm-hmm. And I make sure like whenever I'm in class, whatever course I'm taking, I tie that with food justice. Yeah. Um, so for me, like once I got c- um, settled with political science, I'm like, how can I use this to benefit my career? Or how can I use it to benefit the field that I'm working in right now? Mm-hmm. And um. I stuck to political science because I felt like I wanted to introduce food as a major topic in politics because mm. a lot of times food do get overlooked. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you have like crisis in other countries or crisis in general within this country, food is the first thing that we, we go for. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet food is the same thing that people don't have access to, a lot yeah. of food or healthy food. Um, they don't know about it, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's my goal is to like bring food more into pol- in the political um, sphere yeah. and um, raise that issue and make sure that people are receiving proper, adequate food in their community. Okay. Before we start talking about food, let's see how people in the community feel about health. Hello, and welcome to YouTube. I'm Ezekiel Mejia, and today we're going to walk around the community and ask people, what is one thing they do to stay healthy? Um, your name is? My name is Dee. And what is one thing you do to stay healthy? The same thing I'm about to do right now. I go to the gym three, sometimes five days a week. I listen to a lot of music and I meditate just to relax, especially in the world that we live in now. New York City being so stressful. Sometimes you just need to separate yourself from everyone else and just get into your own space and just free yourself that way. So go to the gym, listen to music, Um, turn your phone off if you can in the year 2018. Turn it off and just take yourself away and relax. Your name is? Ivan. And what is one thing you do to stay healthy? Um, For once, I drink Herbalife. I don't know if um, anybody's heard of the supplements Herbalife. They're nutritious and they also help you to lose weight. And I also work out in the gym. I actually lost 38 pounds with drinking Herbalife alone. 
and I just recently started at the gym. So. So what would you say to the youth of today to stay healthy? Um, stop smoking, definitely. Um, eat healthy. Even though we understand that healthy foods are expensive, but if we could get a pair of kicks for two hundred dollars, that's not gonna last us that long. We can buy, you know, healthy foods and just stay active. You know, that's what I tell the youth. And your, um, your name is. My name is Lillian Rodriguez. And what is one thing you do to stay healthy? Healthy to drink a lot of water. Vegetable eat a lot of vegetable. You know different kind of vegetable, fruit, you know, eat healthy. That's what I, I want to say, you know. And are you like a parent or are you a mom or? And what is one thing that you would like say to your grandkids? To say to get healthy? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, to eat good. Um, in the house, you know, don't eat fried things, you know, fried things is not good. Uh, boiling things, you know, boiling things like, the chicken, you know, all the meat. Yeah. I bought first before I put in fry. I don't, I don't like fried things. Mm. Oh. Your name is? Chris. And what is one thing you do to stay healthy? I try to drink a lot of water and exercise at least three to four times a week. And just stay active, play sports, you know. My job's already active, so I get a lot of working out there. And if there was one thing you can tell to the youth to, do, um, to be healthy, what would it be? and try to get outside and play more, not just stay inside and play video games all day. <laughs> all right, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for watching YouTube. We hope you enjoy it. Now back to you, Mike. Welcome back. Um, how did you first get involved in farming? Um, so when I first came to America, I realized, like, the first thing I saw was just, like, concrete everywhere, yeah. bricks everywhere. I'm like, where's the garden? Concrete where's jungle. the space? Yeah. Like, I'm not used to this. Um, <coughs> so I finished um, middle school. I only had, like, one year left. And then I went into high school. Mm -hmm. And um, my first summer working at the age of 14, I got involved with New York City Green Gorillas. Mm -hmm. And basically their program is structured where they take you to different community gardens and help either rebuild or help maintain that space. Okay. Um, so I got to like interact with different community gardens, um, members, um, growers, and elders. Okay. And um, I got really connected to that work. So when I went back to school, um, and I attended Academy for Environmental Leadership, mm -hmm. they had a green team program. Um, and it's like a, a mini club that we have it was like an after school mini club and we met for like two hours and we do like a lot of projects together we talk about like what is food justice okay. and then that turned into like having a farm on campus so i was really excited with that program and then since then i just got hooked in food justice for the past eight years yeah. <laughs> um, and i just enjoy the work because mm -hmm. after the years progressively my role has changed in food justice mm -hmm. and i've like acquired new skills as i go along so okay. that's how i got involved in farming first it was a summer program and mm -hmm. then having my own farm on, a, on my school campus yeah. and then going off into that and just becoming like a farm manager, supervisor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you briefly explain what the Youth Food Justice Network is and like what type of work is done there? Yeah, basically. so the Youth Food Justice Network is basically a network that hosts multiple organizations within New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what we do at the Youth Food Justice Network is host craft days. And craft days are basically um, days that youth will like go out into the community and, and, and interact with other youth groups. Yeah. And they help to facilitate workshops mm -hmm. or they go and work on different community gardens. Okay. Um, and basically that's what we do. Like we come together as a team, we have like four to five different core members, mm -hmm. and they're all from each boroughs. We try to make sure that every single borough is included yeah. and represented, and that um, every all the youth are like interacting together and creating like a bond, because you never mm -hmm. know, like in the food justice field, like later down yeah. the line, I could see and be like, hey, we work together, <laughs> like, you know, we're having fun, and we had fun. Um, so that's what the network is, so just to build that like support, um, um, and that building that uh, connect between youth amongst mm -hmm. um, the boroughs. Why was it started? It was started, honestly, like mm -hmm. it's just 
started out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it was, um, we had, I remember, I forgot what year, I think it was 2014. Mm -hmm. um, we had a conference at East New York Farms. Okay. And that conference just brought over 100 youth together. Oh. And we felt like it was really cool. So we were like, how can we maintain these bonds? How can we maintain these relationships? And then progressively over the years, it just like those five organizations, major organizations that were involved in that conference, yeah. we just stuck together. Mm -hmm. And then we just developed the Northeast Regional Youth for Justice Network. Then we're like, that's too long. <laughs> so then we shortened it down to like Youth for Justice Network. Yeah. Um, and that's how we started, like just from one conference gathering. Okay. Yeah. What do you enjoy most about working with the East New York Farms? Mm -hmm. I love, love, love my relationship with the interns because mm -hmm. we have 32 interns. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I love all of them. They're like, it's very diverse, a very dynamic group. Um, and I love my relationship with the intern because I'm, I'm in their age group, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, um, I was I was 14, 15 yeah. once, and this is how I was, mm -hmm. like, you know, and because I'm still young and I could relate with them, I love my relationship with them because for me, I see myself as, like, their older sister. Okay. Um, even though I'm, like, their supervisor, I'm like, how can I build that bond with those interns so that they could trust me? So I love, for one, is my relationship with the interns. They're yeah. all so smart. They're all so sweet, and mm -hmm. they're so very, like, educated. Um, and very mature for their age, mm -hmm. and for them to have such a dedication to like a program like this that's mm -hmm. so like could be very challenging at times. Yeah. I love my relationship with them. Um, and secondly, with the elders, we okay. have like a lot of like um, older gardeners that we work with closely. I love my relationship with them, and even as a market manager, I had to like have a close relationship with them, talk to them on a yeah. consistent basis, um, mm -hmm. trying to interact with them as much as possible. Um, mm -hmm. So that's also something that I pride in. Um, and since they're like from the Caribbean as well, yeah. it's easier for me to like understand them. Mm -hmm. like you know their background and everything. Exactly, and it's mm -hmm. easier for us to have like a relationship because they're like, oh, you're from Jamaica, yeah. I'm from here. Like we, yeah. we stick together, like, yeah. you know, and I view them as like my aunts and my grandmothers. So mm -hmm. like definitely I love the relationship that East New York farms have mm -hmm. with like East New York community. Yeah. Yeah. What obstacles are faced in your line of work? What are the, some of the toughest ones? In my line of work, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is so dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. um, one obstacle that I face is losing space, uh -oh. growing space. It's very hard like when you've seen a garden that you've put in so much work and so much dedication in, mm -hmm. a garden that the community has like, have some form of ties to and bonded with, yeah. and then a couple years later, it's not it's there the anymore. Yeah. Like, you know, mm -hmm. that's a very tough um, thing that we deal with in food justice is mm -hmm. like land access and oh, land okay. access for good reasons. Because um, a lot of times um, the city might give you a land and be like, oh, you only have this for five years. And then yeah. when that five years come, it's like, it's gone. Yeah. Like, you know, and then it's like, where did my, my history go? Yeah, like, like, yeah, like, like you know, yeah. exactly. Like, you can't really like, be like, oh yeah, I used to work here. Mm. Or like, I used to have this garden, but now yeah. it's not there anymore. So I think that's something that we definitely face. It's like mm -hmm. so many hard work and dedication that got just removed. And yeah, and it's, it's very heartbreaking. And that's very like deep for me because right now that's something that I'm facing um, in Bushwick at my high school, mm. like where now, that community garden okay. is going to be like uprooted and, and be gone. It's kind of yeah. like, I can't really say at my school, mm -hmm. I used to have this. Like, if somebody's supposed to go there and like have a tour of it, it's not going to be there anymore. That's yeah. not like a comp component to the school itself. And then that's like lost history. So that's like something that, that's like a challenge for me, like how yeah. to deal with that. Like, okay. I enjoyed talking and learning about you today. But right now, I want to teach you something. We have a historical fact of the day. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Fact of the Day. I'm Ray, your host. 
and I'm here to talk about a man who illustrated the importance of ensuring the wellness of underserved communities with an incredible charitable program. Born to a sharecropper and Baptist preacher on February 17, 1942, in Monroe, Louisiana, Newton taught himself to read and eventually earned his PhD in social philosophy. Active in politics, especially the rights of African Americans, he and co-founder Bobby Seale formed the Black Panther Party. His ideology and mission was perfectly manifested in the Black Panther Party's free breakfast program, which served breakfast to unprivileged communities. The program was tied into the Black Panther Party's belief that economic exploitation is the root of oppression. It showed they were not willing to leave out and help those who were not financially stable from having full, complete well-being. The Black Panthers Party first free breakfast program was born in the Black Panthers Party headquarters, St. Augustine Episcopal Church in Oakland, California in 1969. What started as a tiny manifestation of founders Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale's mission to provide a badly needed service for impoverished communities soon became a widespread across the country. By the end of 1969, the Black Panther Party was serving free breakfast to thousands of children in cities across America. A notable facilitator of these programs was Black Panther Party member Fred Hampton, who operated in Chicago. He started five different free breakfast programs in the city's west side, along with medical center and health services for families in Chicago. Unfortunately, the Black Panther Party's efforts to serve America were cut short by efforts of the United States government. By the end of 1980s, the Black Panther Party, for the most part, was gone. Along with the free breakfast programs due to the infiltrations by the FBI, which were often brutally violent, in fact, Fred Hampton was killed in an armed raid by the Chicago Police Department on December 3rd, 1969. Despite the demise of the Black Panther Party by the United States government, the influence of the free breakfast programs is still present today. The Black Panther Party's social services exposed the shortcomings of the federal government when it came to supporting the country's impoverished people. When the breakfast program started, the Black Panthers were serving more breakfasts than the United States government, despite the Child Nutrition Act being passed in 1966. This forced the government to expand and improve its free breakfast services, culminating the free breakfasts that American children have in their schools today. Huey P. Newton died in Oakland, California on August 22nd, 1989 from a gunshot wound. Today, he is immortalized as a revolutionary activist, leader, and an icon whose free breakfast programs and other alternatives allowed for the well-being of those who were not as privileged as others. Well, looks like time has run out for a show, but the events of history still leave a mark in the present. Thank you for listening to today's Fact of the Day, and we would like to thank you for watching. History today isn't the history of tomorrow. Get out there and make your own history, and we'll see you next time. If you're just now tuning in, you're watching Ujamaa with our guest, Aishima Harris. Um, what impact do you believe the Youth Food Justice Network has made so far? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, for one, when it comes to like conference spaces, I mm -hmm. feel like we definitely introduce a lot of youth in that space. For instance, um, two of our major conferences that we've worked on um, in New York and regional wise is the Just Food Conference, which is based in New York City every mm -hmm. March. Um, last year we had this project where we had to bring over a hundred youth to the conference and that was like their first ever push to have youth at the conference. So we developed something that's called a youth track. Mm -hmm. And basically the youth track is where we try to um, empower and demonstrate youth leadership within the food justice movement. Okay. So we have youth that are leading workshops mm -hmm. and like teaching their peers and others like what they've been doing throughout the year. Uh, um, and you, you bring a hundred youth? Yeah. They weren't rowdy at all? They no. They was okay. No, they were excited because <laughs> 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 they were super excited because mm -hmm. we had like a whole program planned for just youth. We had like a nice breakfast, a oh. nice like registration, a nice lunch. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we had like a big group room where they came together and played games. Like okay. they played bingo, um, a lot of Uno. <laughs> like <laughs> it was fun. Like mm -hmm. I wish I was there. I wish I was like be able to like en engage with them mm -hmm. more. Um, and then another project that we work on was New Stock, which is Northeast. Um, Sustainable Agriculture Working Group, mm -hmm. and that's like a regional conference okay. where every year we try to 
um, do a workshop as a network or we try to bring like a lot of youth. So last year we brought like 15 youth and this year we brought 60. Oh. Um, right, and good. that's like, and that was in Baltimore. So imagine yeah. us in like vans, like <laughs> driving it's to like Baltimore. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I feel that that was really great. And that's very impactful because wherever there is like no youth voices, we mm. go in with a force like, hey, we want to be present. We want to be here. And this is what we could offer. Mm -hmm. And in return, this is what you could offer us. Like, just give us a p the space and the platform to present ourselves and represent ourselves and not having adults, like, speak for us. Because yeah. I feel like a lot of times, like, that kind of get, like, misconstrued. Mm -hmm. Like, if it, it's like having an adult, like, saying what sh you're saying, but it's yeah. like you're not saying it in my voice or mm -hmm. in my way. You're just, like, saying it as an interpretation, yeah. which, could, which could be rude in a sense. So we try to make sure that youth have the platform get to say whatever they want to say, however mm. they want to say it. Um, and we support them in that. So that's that's something that we do. How and why did you start the Youth Food Justice Network? <laughs> I started Youth Food Justice Network because I do, since I was 16, mm. and I attended my first conference, um, and I forgot where that was, but it was out of state, yeah. and it's called NOFA. Um, and basically, when I went there, it was just a lot of adults, yeah. and I had to do the workshops. And like when I looked in the room, it was adults, mm -hmm. and I'm like, why am I teaching you guys? Like I want to teach my peers. I want to show up to my peers. I want to tell my peers what I'm doing, and yeah. I want my peers to tell me what they're doing. Like you know, I want that feedback. Like you know, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's why I started the network, and that's why I got involved with the network because the network just it's for youth, yeah. basically. Youth lead the network. They tell us what they want, um, and we work with them. Like any project that we're working on, mm -hmm. we always go to the youth. Like, hey, we have this conference that's coming up. What do you want to do? How can we do it? Yeah. Um, we have this craft day that's coming up. What do you want to see as a craft day? Like they're like, oh, I want to go to more community gardens and I want to do more work. Mm -hmm. Sure, let's like plan those trips for you. Um, or I want to go out of state more. I want to do a mm. camping trip. Like, how can we do that? How can we support you? Yeah. And we try to make those connections happen as much as possible for the youth. So, yeah. What are the long-term goals when it comes to food justice? And what do you personally want to change? Oh, my God. A long-term goal? Yeah. I'm working on it right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, I personally, what I personally want to change in food justice um, is jobs ex job accessibility mm -hmm. and food justice is really is a large there's yeah. a lot of components that you could fit in food justice but at the same time we lose a lot of amazing youth in mm -hmm. food justice because we don't have job accessibility yeah. um and that's something that's my long-term goal to change because i work with like a lot of amaz amazing youth and i'm like where are you guys gonna go what are yeah. you gonna do after this like how can i keep you like mm -hmm. you know because you're so great um, and you're important for food justice or like how can I connect you to other programs mm -hmm. that could hire you so that you could have a job you could have like a stake in food justice and yeah. be the amazing leader that you are um, so that's my goal is like how can I create these opportunities for interns and for youth in food justice that really want to work that really mm -hmm. want to that believe in food justice and that's their like their their mission that's their passion you know yeah. so that's a long-term goal for me and that's something that i'm working on like if i'm organizing a conference mm -hmm. i make sure i have a youth involved or youth yeah. involved with me like how can i create jobs in that conference for that youth to come in and be involved with it and mm. that's like something that could add to their resume like yeah. i planned a conference <laughs> like you know that's very major at a young age yeah. and that's a lot of responsibility and yeah, that's that's the long term goal for me is to create job accessibility in food okay. justice. Uh, you talking about you work with young interns. Mm -hmm. What are some of the notable accomplish accomplishments that you've seen them do? Oh my god! One that stands um, out to you. A lot of interns when they come into the program, mm -hmm. they're so shy. Yeah. And at the end of the year, they're they like blossom mm -hmm. into like this 
big, beautiful sunflower. They're like, where did you come <laughs> from? Like, you know, I've never yeah. noticed this before. And I feel like even for them, like when they start the program, they're always like, I started off shy. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure what I was going to do or who I was going to become. But I stuck through it, and I'm very proud of myself for that. Yeah. A lot of interns are like, you have, I have to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning. I never thought I could be, like, that accountable or, like, yeah. that, like, responsible of my time. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of myself for stepping up and, like, actually showing up to work on time every single time. Yeah. And a lot of interns feel like with the with the – the internship program, mm -hmm. they get to travel a lot because sometimes, like, they don't leave Brooklyn. They don't leave New York. Yeah. So, like, for them to, like, go to different states, to different conferences and interact with different youth from other states, mm -hmm. they really enjoy that. And they feel like that's a great accomplishment for them because when they go back to school, they could brag, like, this is what <laughs> I did all summer. Like, you know, mm -hmm. so that's something that a lot of interns always get, like, they're glad they're a part of the program because of those reasons. Okay. Yeah. How can youth get involved in your organizations? What is the process for that? Um, so my, it's easy. Like you have different, different levels. Like you could come in volunteer. We always like welcome volunteers. Like if you have something for you to do, okay. we want you to do it. And volunteers meaning that you could work on the farm. You could work with us in the office. Like you mm -hmm. could work with a staff one on one. Um, and we try to see what you're great at and where we could place you. Uh, we try to engage your interests as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, we had a volunteer that really wants to be more involved with organizing. Mm -hmm. So I have that volunteer work with me closely because I organize for the Youth for Justice Network yeah. and like I ask them to assist me with the Youth for Justice Network. Thank you for <coughs> watching today's episode of Ujama. Our guest has shown us the importance of knowing where your food comes from, sustainability, and how growing food strengthens communities. Perhaps you've been inspired to get involved as well. Introduce yourself to the local community garden or even try to start a new one at your school or somewhere else. See you next time.